Good evening, everyone. Hi. So good to see you all here. I am honored and thrilled to be able to introduce um, Rebecca Waters, uh, who is here to give one of her wonderful presentations all about her Wolverine uh, research. Rebecca Waters is the executive director of the Wolverine Foundation and the founder of the Mongolian Wolverine Project. She has a BA in anthropology from St. Lawrence University and a master's in environmental science from the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. She served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Mongolia and has studied and worked in Kenya, India, and Cambodia on an environmental research and human rights issues. She won an award for her talk Wolverines Without Borders, <laughs> Thinking Big About Conservation and Climate Change. In 2013 uh, was her first trek of 230 miles in the remote and vast uh, Darhad region of Mongolia, carrying everything she needed food, tent, <laughs> sleeping bag. Um, and then in, in, in 2014, after that, she presented a TEDx talk in Bozeman, Montana. In the spring of, just this spring of 2019, she did another research trek back to the same area, <coughs> logging 350 miles, and this, by the way, I might not have said, was on cross-country skis. <laughs> at the, she is considered to be at the forefront of a new, younger wave of field scientists advancing the knowledge of wild uh, life in this ecosystem. Rebecca grew up in Southboro, and she is a graduate of Algonquin Regional High School and my former next door neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a, and she has mentioned that there are people here from the full range of her, um, her life. Yes. Uh, Rebecca Waters. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you to the Southboro Open Land Foundation for arranging this talk, and thank you to the Southboro Library and to Ryan for putting up with impromptu visits and helping set all of this up and make it happen. And thank you all for showing up uh, on a, what is it, a Thursday evening to hear about my pet passionate project, Wolverines. Um, this is actually the first time that I've given a presentation to so many people who knew me so well at a stage of my life before I became a Wolverine expert. So I'm a little nervous in a way that I am not usually, but I'm also really happy to see so many people who have been such a part of making me who I am. So with no further ado, um, here is a picture of a Wolverine in Montana, not Mongolia. Um, I just want to give the obligatory uh, 30 seconds about what the Wolverine Foundation is and what we do. Wolverines um, are a species with a crazy bad reputation and very little is known about them. This foundation was started in 1996 by the world's Wolverine biologists, of which at the time there were probably about five. Um, in order to promote wildlife research, uh, Wolverine research and conservation, we are a scientific organization. We are not an advocacy organization. Um, you can check out our website at thewolverinefoundation.org. Um, we do uh, research. We support research through small grants. We do peer review and analysis of the published science for policy purposes. Um, we mentor younger scientists, one of whom is in this audience. <laughs> um, 
We develop our own scientific programs, including the Mongolia Project and some work that has been done in the Western United States. And we do education and outreach, so presentations such as this one. We maintain a Facebook page, for those of you who are still on Facebook. Um, and uh, we give talks, and um, I field a lot of requests from various media outlets for interviews and filming and stuff like that. So. On to the good stuff. This is March 22nd of this year on the Gun River in northern Mongolia. Uh, about five minutes after we set out for our Wolverine expedition, <coughs> we came across this set of tracks. And we were excited because that meant that we had had success. Um, these are expedition members Jen Higgins and up front Dylan Taylor and his wife Sarah Olson in the lead skiing down the river on what would be, uh, I can try turning this on again but I'm afraid it's going to. There's apparently a, a very recent oh. malfunction with the microphone. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll try to do this as long as it doesn't start uh, fuzzing again. So um, this is the first day of what turned out to be a 29-day, 350-mile uh, expedition. How did we get to this point? Well, this is Mongolia. This is obviously an old map of Mongolia. Um, and I used to keep this in here as a joke about Putin's aspirations to reform the Soviet Union, but that really doesn't seem like such a joke anymore. So um, now I'm just keeping it in because I feel like it's the situation we're dealing with. Um, but Mongolia is an independent nation that is sandwiched between China to the south and Russia to the north. And um, it's, it's kind of like a mouse holding apart the jaws of a lion. It's a functioning democracy sandwiched between two of the most autocratic nations on earth, which I think in and of itself is illustration of and testimony to the character of the Mongolian people. It's one of the reasons I love working there. The part of Mongolia where this expedition is taking place is the far northern reach in a, in a place called Hovskul province. Um, and it's ecologically, it's basically Siberia. It's the southernmost reach of the Siberian taiga forest. Um, but it is uh, dip or, um, <coughs> part of the country of Mongolia. If you look at this area on Google Earth, you can see uh, it's pretty mountainous and well forested. Up here, you have the Cyan mountain range coming down uh, into this region. And this whole complex of mountains is the Altai. And in total, this is referred to as the Altai Cyan ecosystem. This big blue lake up here, does anyone know what that lake is? Yeah, that's Lake Baikal. Baikal, by the way, is the Mongolian word for nature. This region, although it is part of Russia, is ethnically Mongolian. It's ethnically Buryat. They are a Mongol tribe. And uh, all, almost all of the place names up here are either Mongol de of Mongolian derivation or Turkic. Uh, tribal derivation. Um, so this is, it is part of Russia, but it is an indigenous part of Russia. Um, this lake here is Lake Hovskul. Um, it's part of the same rifting system that created like Lake Baikal. So Lake Baikal, is, it's a place where the um, continents are pulling apart and it's filling with water. And this system of rifts has extended south into Mongolia and formed this little lake, this smaller lake. It's not that little, actually. <laughs> it's quite large. Um, lake Hovskul. And then just to the west, you see this valley here. This is also part of that rifting system. And that is the Darhad Valley, or the Darhad Depression. During the Pleistocene, there was an ice dam on the river that drains this valley, and it was also a lake. That ice dam broke, and it is now a steppe um, area full of wetlands, which are full of migratory waterfowl, <laughs> which someone in this room has also done a really good study on. So this is the setup of um, the, the area where we are doing this expedition. This is a view from the valley floor looking towards the mountains. Um, it's a very, you know, the weather changes quite a lot out there. It can be very dramatic. Um, this is actually the view from one of our rangers' outhouses. 
I call it the million dollar outhouse view because there are like gazillionaires in Jackson Hole, Wyoming who would probably murder somebody to build a house with a nice picture window with that view. And every time anybody in that family goes out to use the loop, they get the view. So do my students. This is also a region of the world where mountains are literally worshipped. Um, the mountains are alive. You have to be very respectful of the mountains when you go into them. It's something I talk with my students and also fellow expedition members about. Um, and these mountain shrines called ovos are all over the place. Every time you go over a pass or you go to the top of a peak or you approach a place that is considered powerful on the landscape, you must pay your respects to the place. And you must ask permission to be there. And if something goes wrong, that's considered a sign that you need to rethink your approach to being on the landscape. It's a very, very different sort of cultural environment than I think most of us are used to being in when we think about recreation. We are not in charge in this landscape. These, these mountains have owners, and the owners are the ones to whom you need to be in communication about what your plans are. It is an area that is probably most renowned in terms of its human cultures for the Darhad uh, reindeer, or the, I'm sorry, the Dukha reindeer herding people, also known as the Tsatan. You'll see a lot of um, Facebook uh, articles circulating around about this lost tribe of reindeer herders in Mongolia. They're not lost. They, they know exactly where they are. <laughs> Please don't share those articles. Um, but these are, these are the southernmost uh, population of reindeer, reindeer herders in the world. They keep their reindeer mostly for milking and for riding. They do not eat them unless they absolutely have to. They rely on hunting um, to get most of their protein and reindeer milk and reindeer cheese, of course. This is one of the reindeer herder encampments up in the mountains, up in the taiga. And uh, there's, they do still live in these, these structures. They call them orts. Um, most people in Mongolia, even people who live out in the mountains in these remote locations, are pretty well educated. The literacy rate is about 97%. Um, and uh, a lot of these people have also been to university. So, you know, you'll be back in the backcountry thinking that you're with some lost tribe, so to speak, and somebody will suddenly start a conversation about how much they enjoy the novels of Gabriel Garcia Marquez <laughs> and what do you think of A Hundred Years of Solitude. <laughs> so, you know, it's a really cool place. Down on the valley floor, um, out of the mountains, a more traditional Mongolian style of pastoralism prevails. People have horses, goats, camels, sheep, yaks, cows, and they milk these animals and they raise them for meat. Most of it is still uh, household-based, so they're not selling these into any kind of um, industry. They are just raising uh, the animals and the livestock for their supporting their own households. And it is nomadic. Um, people migrate uh, seasonally between different pastures. This actually is one of the regions of Mongolia where people still undertake non-motorized, very long-range um, migrations up over the mountains between the Darhad Valley and the lake that is on the other side of the mountains. And uh, those migrations can last for up to a week. And they are done entirely on foot. You get up at four in the morning, you break your camp down, you put everything into panniers um, on, your, on your yaks or your camels, and you go for the day and then set up camp in the evening, build your gear, and um, do it again until you get to where you're going. So this is one of the last places in the world where this kind of lifestyle persist. So what are we doing in this area anyway? Why were we there? Wolverines. What's the deal with wolverines? I mentioned before <coughs> that there are quite a lot of misperceptions about wolverines and in order to do my job educating you guys I just want to address some of those right away. Um, how many of you actually know what a wolverine is? What family does it belong to? It's a, yeah, it's a weasel or a mustelid. Very good. How many toes does it have? Five. Yep, it has five toes, like humans and like bears. Um, it's the largest terrestrial member of the weasel family. What else is unique about it? Where do they live? North? Snow, yeah. Um, what is a wolverine baby called? Okay, Dad, you can't answer. 
I thought I was uh, kind of being uh, a ringer. <laughs> no. Yes, baby wolverines are called kits. Um, somebody who hasn't spent the last 10 years listening to me drone on about this stuff. <laughs> Where do wolver Has anybody in here ever seen a wolverine in the wild? No, okay. Um, where do wolverines live in the United States? Alaska, Alaska Minnesota. Montana, Minnesota, Minnesota, Michigan. Min <laughs> Minnesota and Michigan are interesting. They were there at some point, but there is no current population in those areas. Um, do any of you guys like the X-Men? Is anyone here because of the X-Men? <laughs> okay. Does anyone here think werewolves are real? Just checking. So there are plenty of uh, basic facts about wolverines, but um, the thing that intrigues me about this species are the things that make it a wolverine ecologically. So not just how you categorize it, but what it does and what that means for conservation. So ecologically, what is a wolverine? It's opportunistic, which means that within certain limits, it can take advantage of pretty much any food source. What's the Latin name for the wolverine? What does that mean? Yeah, gulo gulo, meaning the glutton of all gluttons, the glutton that just can't stop gluttoning. They're naturally rare, and this is important when you're thinking about conservation, because we think of rare species as inherently in need of conservation, and yet some species are naturally rare, which means that you're never going to have a lot of them on the landscape. And that means you have to think about the way you can serve them a little bit differently. They're highly mobile. so. Wolverines can travel enormous distances. They're territorial, and that means that they defend a home range. They have very low reproductive rates. This pertains to why they're naturally rare. And they are cold and snow dependent. They have, we, we think they have what we refer to as an obligate relationship with snow. That means that they absolutely have to be in places with snow. This is their global distribution. Um, this is not the best map in the world, but this white area up here. So in both the Eastern and Western Hemisphere, they're what we refer to as circumboreal or circumpolar. And in North America, their distribution currently looks <coughs> like this. Um, north is 60 degrees north latitude. Pretty much everything is wolverine habitat. As you move south, the boreal forest is habitat and the Rocky Mountains are habitat, but the plains are not. There used to be, at the time of European colonization, there were wolverines in eastern Quebec as well. Henry David Thoreau reported a wolverine sighting in Maine, I think. Nobody is totally sure whether he actually saw a wolverine or whether he saw a lynx, because again, wolverines are apparently very confusing to people, even him. Um, but it is possible that a wolverine from eastern Quebec could have dispersed down into Maine at that time. However, currently there are no wolverines in any of this area here. So there are no wolverines in New England and there are no wolverines in Michigan. Despite the reputation of it being the wolverine state, we think that that has to do with the fact that that was the trading post point through which wolverine pelts were passing. As far as we can tell from the historical records, that's where the, the wolverine state myth uh, comes from. Sorry, has, is anybody here from Michigan? <laughs> and Wolverine. Okay, and was, that was my next question. I, I, my deepest apologies, I hope I haven't disillusioned you um, in any way. I think that there, there could potentially be dispersers that might start making it down from Ontario. So, you know, hold out hope, okay? <laughs> And the reason we have this distribution, of course, is because the wolverine is an animal of the tundra. And as you move south, this kind of habitat moves into the boreal forest. And by the time you get down here into the Rocky Mountain states of the United States, that habitat is on top of the mountains. So this is where I got my start in wolverine stuff, uh, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, and this is what the distribution actually looks like. If you look on the ground, it's pretty patchy. It's what we refer to as a metapopulation. I'm not going to get into all of the, di the, the discussion about what that means here, um, but you know, the, the pertinent point is that this is an island. Wolverines are territorial. They have very large territories. And so a mountain range, even a sizable one, can only hold a few adult wolverines. 
Um, and in order for a young wolverine to find a home, it needs to cross an awful lot of inhospitable habitat to make it to a place where it can make a living. Another conservation challenge for this species. Um, in the lower 48, who knows about uh, what happened during um, the colonization of the western states when cattle ranchers went out there? What was, the, what was the, one of the big things that cattle ranchers wanted off the landscape in order to make their cattle ranching successful? Yeah, predators in general and wolves specifically. How did they do that? What was the big, aside from bounties and go, going out and shooting them, what was the big thing that, that they did? Poison. Yeah, they put out poison bait all over the place. Wolverines are scavengers. They have very good noses. They're very adept at finding carrion on the landscape. And what we now know from the genetics happened is that wolverines were basically entirely wiped off the landscape of the lower 48 states because they were so good at getting into these poison baits. And they're naturally rare. The population dropped so precipitously that they just basically went extinct and or were extirpated from the lower 48. And w the wolverines that we have there um, have recolonized from Canada it, since the <coughs> 1920s, basically. Um, and we know that's this because before, um, these, are f these are haplotypes from museum specimens. If you look at the genetic profile of wolverines from museum speci specimens at the time of colonization, this certain region that we look at, uh, this is what the distribution of that, the genetics looks like for that, those haplotypes. Um, this is what it looks like now. And you can see that this, this haplotype here was really only in the northern part of the US. Um, and now it's, that's the pervasive haplotype. So we've lost genetic diversity through this process of extirpation um, of these wolverines that were in the lower 48. Uh, these are some projects that have been done, and wolverines were basically unstudied in the U.S., uh, at least in the lower 48, until about 2000, when we started getting all of these studies going. I'm not going to get into um, the details of these studies, but I'm, I'm going to tell you about uh, how these were done. So, how many of you, has anybody here done wildlife work where you collar wildlife? Yeah, it's pretty intensive, right? It's pretty invasive. <laughs> Um, especially when you're dealing with uh, approximately 40 pound ferocious carnivore that will eat anything, uh, including you, if it gets, no, that actually, I'm sorry, that's an exaggeration. But they do, they, they are very adept at like getting out of traps and they're notorious for that. And so to live trap a wolverine, you have to build this log box thing and then you deploy it. This is the trap in the fall when it was built. This is the trap in the winter. It's quite a lot of snow. <laughs> Um, and you wait until the wolverine goes into that box. You bolt a piece of carrion to the back. Their preferred bait is beaver. Nobody knows why. Wolverines. Is what? Beaver. beaver. Do you want some, Debbie? <laughs> you got some, some beaver problem in your backyard, I've noticed. So. Not a problem. Okay. <laughs> well, if it gets to me, let me know. Um, and uh, for, for whatever reason, like beaver is just like wolverine candy. They love it. And so if you put a beaver on the back of that, uh, and you rig it to a wire, the wolverine will come and pull it and it will spring the trap lid. Um, and then you have approximately four hours to get to the trap because the wolverine can chew through those logs in that amount of time. Wow. Um, you have a big stick, you put some ketamine on the end of the stick in a syringe, and one person opens the trap and shines a flashlight to get the wolverine to look this way, and the person over here tries to jab the wolverine with the syringe on the stick, um, and hopefully that goes well. Um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and then you put a collar on it and you let them go and then you try to follow it. Now this was before, a lot of these studies were before the advent of GPS collars. Now you can get your collars to transmit to a satellite. At the time that these projects were running, you really couldn't, which meant that you had to go out and get a visual on that Wolverine in order to download the information from the collar or track it with uh, radio telemetry. So if you had a fixed wing aircraft, you could fly that. If you have a helicopter, better yet, go fly that. Snowmobiles, m pretty useful. Sometimes the only way to do it is on skis. This was exhausting and very labor intensive. And so uh, the second generation of Wolverine research has sort of um, asked the questions uh, how can we get these wolverines to come to us so that we don't have to try to follow them in this crazy way? And this uh, second generation of wolverine research relies a lot more on cameras 
These are non-invasive. It doesn't involve drugging the animal, which frankly, you know, we would prefer not to be giving our wildlife ketamine. Um, and you can also do multi-species work, which is, which is important because you find out things about species like lynx, which are also of interest, um, as well as wolverine. The limit is that you can't ask always the same kinds of questions with cameras and DNA that you can ask with collars. So particularly things about females and reproduction and denning periods, you really can't get at with these cameras and genetic methods the way you can with a collar. But a lot of other stuff about population structure, you can. So what have we learned from all of these efforts? Well, wolverines are carnivores. They like to eat meat. They're mostly scavengers. They can sniff out carrion buried in the snow uh, under an avalanche. And they will dig down to it, and they will feed on it for a while, come out, patrol their territory, come back to it in a month, and it's still there in deep freeze for them. They know they have a reliable food source. They're the only ones who can get to it. This is a key strategy that they use. They have enormous territories. These are some of the territory sizes um, from various studies that have been done. Sorry, I forgot to change it out of the metric system, but uh, you know this is the language of science, so hopefully you guys uh, realize that those are significantly large territories. Um, the males, it's about like 500, 600 uh, square miles up to, um, and the females are up to like 300, 350 sometimes, um, sometimes larger than that. This is how the territories work briefly. These are, these are actual wolverines from the Glacier National Park study. So you have one female F4 here and another female F2 over here. You can see that they do not overlap, barely overlap. So these are sex exclusive territories. No adult female will be in a territory with another adult female. This is M1, he's the resident male. I, a good friend of mine made this slide and I have total respect for him. Um, he's a male wildlife biologist, and sometimes I feel like there's a little narrative that goes on amongst male wildlife biologists that they think, you know, it's like, oh, we're explaining, like, human behavior because it's natural, but in fact what we're doing is projecting, I don't know, <coughs> onto the, the species. Um, so it's worth noting that there was another male over here and another male over here. <laughs> so this is an equal opportunity thing, okay? <laughs> I just want to make that clear. All right. Um, M3 is the offspring of M1 and F2. And this is his first year. Uh, he was collared, and this, is, this was his data for the first year of his life. So you see he hangs out in his mom's territory and his dad's territory and the portion of his dad's territory that overlaps with F4s. But he really doesn't go down into F4's territory here because there's another male in there, right? And he doesn't want to be messing with that other male. This is F5, and this is the daughter of F4 and M1. She was a wolverine whose picture was up at the very beginning of this presentation. She used to rampage around and climb mountains for the heck of it. Nobody really knew why she was doing that. She just liked to go to the top of mountains. I felt a, a great deal of affinity for her. But like many human mountaineers, uh, she actually lost her life in an avalanche before she reached dispersal age. So these juvenile wolverines hang out with their parents for a while. And despite the, the long understood reputation of wolverines as surly, nasty, intolerant, socially mean, uh, awful animals who couldn't stand any other wolverines, they actually are social with their family members. They travel together. Um, they feed on kills together. Uh, there's definitely some dominance and posturing behavior going on in these photos, which are of wolverines in Kamchatka eating a bear. Um, that is a dead grizzly bear. Um, they didn't kill it, they just scavenged the carcass. Uh, but if there's a adequate food sources, they, they will tolerate each other. And then once they reach uh, adulthood, they need to set out and find their own home. And they, this is when they can make these huge dispersal movements. So probably the most famous wolverine in this regard is M56, who was collared up here near Jackson, Wyoming <coughs> in early 2009. I tracked him off of Togatee Pass up here. Actually, my sister Amanda tracked him with me. Um, we didn't find him, but we did uh, hear him. And <coughs> then he went down the Wind River Range and parked here for a while. And uh, this was an area where we really didn't think that there were that many wolverines. So that was kind of exciting. We were like, oh, cool, we got a male wolverine in the winds. There's a female in there. Maybe they'll have babies. That's cool. Um, the next thing we knew, some rancher 
called Wyoming Game and Fish and said, uh, I have a wolverine on my carcass, a uh, cow carcass out in my field. And this was down near Lander, which is not wolverine habitat. And we were like, uh, are you sure it's not a badger? And he was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I have a photo of it. And so they went down and they flew and they picked up M56's collar down here. And then he went over here. And at this point, we all started to cross our fingers because we were like, oh my gosh, he could go to Colorado. <laughs> there are no wolverines in Colorado anymore. So he went to Colorado <laughs> on Memorial Day, and he became the first wolverine in Colorado in 90 years. He hung out in Colorado until 2012 when his collar died, and we lost track of him. He was sighted periodically, and then he wasn't sighted anymore, and we were like, well, we don't know where he went. He went all over Colorado. And then in spring of 2016, we got a photo of a wolverine up here in eastern Montana, in the middle of a field. And we were like, wow, that's weird. We don't know for sure that that was M56, but, and this, sorry guys, is a sad part. In April, some guy, ranch hand, posted this on Facebook. He shot this wolverine that was out in his field harassing cows. He says harassing, tormenting. I don't believe it. You know, but I have to defend the wolverine, so maybe it was tormenting them. I don't know. Um, and the, his Facebook friends were like, dude, that's a wolverine. Um, that's the first wolverine in North Dakota in 90 years. And the North Dakota Game and Fish Department came to necropsy the wolverine, and they cut him open, and uh, he had an implant, implanted transmitter, that they put into wolverines when they're tracking them like this, and it was M56. So this animal... Straight line distance traveled more than like tw I think 1,200 miles or 1,700 miles just on these big range movements, right? And that doesn't even count the amount of time he was bombing around the mountains of Colorado doing whatever he was doing there. So um, that's a pretty incredible story, and that's just an illustration of how much wolverines can move. These are wolverine kits. They're week old kits. These are captive kits. Um, I mentioned earlier that they have very low reproductive rates. Um, Usually female wolverine does not have kits until she's three or four years old for the first time. And she then proceeds to have maybe two kits every other year. So you're looking at around a one kit per year reproductive rate, give or take. It's very, very low. Wolverines live for maybe 15 years. So a female wolverine's reproductive potential over the course of her life is quite low. They have a delayed implantation system. They mate in the summer and then the fertilized eggs do not implant unless the female is in adequate condition to carry the pregnancy to term. It's a very, very evolutionarily smart way of dealing with it because a, an adult reproductive female wolverine is way more valuable to the population than her kits, right? Um, you want to have your adult females maintained. You don't want them wasting energy having babies that they're not going to be able to raise. <coughs> yeah, I think all mustelids do, actually. Yep. Bears do as well. So these wolverine kits are white. Any guesses as to why they might be born white? Yeah. yeah. It's good camouflage, right? Um, not that anything can get into one of these snow dens, but if it were to, maybe it just wouldn't see them as well. Um, this is a, a Kamchatkin wolverine. This is actually not a den. I don't want to misrepresent this. This is just a wolverine in a hole in the snow. But wolverines do den in the snow. This is the only time they den. So when people contact me and they're like, hey, I've got a wolverine denning in my backyard in the dirt. I'm like, well, that's not a wolverine. That's badger. Sorry. Um, so they den, the females den in the snow for about three months. We say that uh, wolverine babies are born around Valentine's Day. And they're out of the den around Mother's Day. And for anybody who has a philosophical objection to Valentine's Day, I encourage you to start celebrating it as Wolverine Birthday instead. I'm, I really want this to be a movement. I think Valentine's Day is obnoxious. So let's all celebrate Wolverine Birthday and then uh, Wolverine Mom Liberation Day on Mother's Day. <laughs> so this is again in Glacier. This is a natal den where the wolverines are born. And this is a maternal den where the wolverine um, moved her kits after a couple of weeks. Uh, actually, I think this is about a month into um, the study. So again, this is the collar data. We knew she was in this den because the collar was telling us that. Um, and then we knew she was up here because the collar data was telling us that. And she had stopped moving. So when they stop moving and they stay in one place for a while, that's when you know that she's, she's in the den with babies. Um, why is the maternal den higher up the mountain than the natal den? 
Yeah, it's the receding snow line. So you see them following the snow line up the mountain until May 15th when they're out of the den, right? Um, and this is a pretty strong indicator that this snow is a preferred strategy for keeping their babies safe and warm. Counterintuitively, of course, snow is quite a good insulator. So all of this research leads us to this 2010 paper, The Bioclimatic Envelope of the Wolverine, do climatic constraints limit its geographic distribution? And in short, without getting into too much of the detail, um, this paper showed pretty definitively that wolverines are tightly, tightly bound to sp late spring snowpack. There was a second paper that was published in 2013, I think, that, or no, actually 2011, that showed that uh, in wolverine habitat over the next 50 years, wolverines stand to lose about uh, somewhere between 30 and 60% of this late spring snowpack habitat due to climate change. And this was used, um, I'm just going to skip this, as the basis for a listing proposal. All of this information, now the so what. Wolverines have been proposed for listing multiple times. They were rejected under the ESA in 2014. This is all very political. Um, there, that decision was overturned in 2016. And a new decision is due out within the year, asterisk. That asterisk is because I made this slide <laughs> in June of 20, uh, 2016. A new decision is due out by the end of the year. <laughs> a new decision was due out by uh, the end of 2019, too, and it just hasn't happened. And the reason that they are stalling and stalling and stalling on this is because once you start listing species due to climate change issues, um, you, you're really flying in the face of the narratives of a lot of people in power who don't want cute, charismatic animals being the flagship for climate change concerns. So um, here's my bigger so what for all of us as Americans. There are obviously a lot of important groups that are missing from this picture at the founding of our nation. Um, I mean, I'm not represented there. <laughs> there are no people of color. Um, but there are also no non-human beings, and yet that is part of our heritage in this nation, right? Part of what makes us Americans is our American wildlife and our American landscape. And wildlife and, and these landscape features are commons, and we don't have a, a, a very effective way of managing commons in our country. So wildlife and wildlife conservation provides a place where we can talk about how to make democracy function better to preserve a common interest. It makes me a little sad to see this slide because I made this one back in 2014 and um, that was back in the day when I thought we had a problem talking about like the science of wildlife honestly and truthfully uh, and the facts around wildlife conservation honestly and truthfully. Obviously we have a much bigger problem than I realized then and so um, I still think that this is true, but I think it's, it's gone well beyond just wildlife. As, as a, there are other things we also need to be talking about when we talk about how we keep our democracy functioning and how we keep our commons functioning. All right, now I'm done with my soapbox. Uh, let's go to Mongolia. <laughs> so um, this is a view of the Hordal Sardik uh, mountain range up in the Darhad Valley. And that snow and temperature model, which I didn't go into, these are areas, the yellow areas are late spring snowpack areas. So if you model this wolverine habitat characteristic of late spring snowpack that they require globally, uh, this is what the model looks like for Mongolia. And this obviously is the biggest area of modeled habitat. So this is where, although I traveled to all of these places when I began the Mongolia project and did a bunch of interviews and thought about uh, different places to start the project, um, this, this one down here, by the way, is a control. I just wanted to make sure that my interview technique was not giving me false positives on wolverine locations. And so I went down to a place where I predicted there were no wolverines um, and interviewed there. And it turned out there nobody had seen wolverines there, which gave me more confidence that they weren't just trying to make me, as the Mongolian-speaking American, happy um, <laughs> by telling me that there was this animal I was interested <coughs> in around. So uh, we, we ended up um, deciding that we were going to focus on this big chunk of, of wolverine habitat up here no in the north part of Mongolia. And in 2013, after interviewing and talking to people and getting samples from pelts, um, we ended up getting a grant from the National Geographic uh, Explorers. Uh, they have a fund for young explorers. Um, and we got a $25,000 grant from them. 
and I set out with uh, five guys to ski around the Darhad Valley and track wolverines. Now, if you were to try to do something like this in the Rocky Mountains, you could put skis on and you could go out there and you could ski around for days and days and days and never find a track. So we were joking in, our, in the office as we were setting up this, this um, expedition that you know, we would be really, really successful if we found one set of tracks. Um, and this was our proposed route. We started over here and we skied all the way up here and around here and then down and came out here. Uh, we ran out of snow. We wanted to do this part of the valley down here, but we didn't have enough snow to actually do that by the time we finished. Uh, these are the resupply points. So although Debbie said I carried everything on my back, that's sort of not true. We did, we did have uh, two resupplies on this trip where we got more food, which was important because if I had tried to carry all the food I needed for an entire month, I would have died. Um, <laughs> And we also got a lot of accusations from our friends that we were just going to do this because we wanted to have a really rad ski trip. <laughs> so I like to put these pictures in to show that this was not a really rad ski trip, <laughs> okay? Uh, this was a lot of what happened when we were skiing down these icy rivers. And when we weren't doing that, this is what was <laughs> happening. <laughs> Um, this, the snowpack here is the continental snowpack. It's really dry, it's unconsolidated, and so it has, there's no base and there's no crust. And so you're just basically slogging all the time, or you're on river ice and you're slipping and sliding around. Uh, and then when we weren't doing either of those things, we were doing this because we were low down in the valley bottoms and there was actually no snow at all. So we had to put our skis on our back and walk. So yeah, not, not a rad ski trip in the sense that most skiers think of rad skiing. However, this is our first day, 45 minutes after setting out. We found our first Wolverine track. And not only that, but we found a scat. So we had a DNA sample. And the objective of this was to go out and see whether there were Wolverines here and start to build a genetic database so that we could do some analysis of the population. And so you can see everybody looks really happy in this picture because we were. We were like, all right, we can quit now. We're 45 minutes into it. We can go home. We're done. We, we've succeeded. So this is day three when we were on our fourth set of wolverine tracks, which we followed down to this uh, log where a wolverine had cached some food, including part of an elk and a capercaillie, which is a kind of gigantic grouse. Um, and we were like, oh my gosh, this is so rare to find a wolverine food cache site. This is so exciting. Um, I think we had like two DNA samples at this point, so we were like, hey, even better. Um, this is day 13, uh, wolverine track number 17. And I put this picture in here because <laughs> this was the set of wolverine tracks where you can see the guys are like plowing on ahead. And I was like, guys, guys, wolverine tracks. Oh my gosh, we have to stop and mark them and document them. And they were like, really? It's just another set of Wolverine tracks. <laughs> we need to get to our resupply. We're all starving. <laughs> um, tall, large guys eat a lot more than women, which is something I actually learned on this trip. I still had plenty of food. I was like, we're going to stop and look at these tracks, guys. Um, so you know, this was pretty incredibly successful. We skied for 23 days, 370 kilometers, 28 sets of Wolverine tracks, 33 DNA samples, and tracks of other species most importantly, including snow leopard. <laughs> and this place here, this pass, which is called Otrik, um, the snow leopard tracks were right across here. This is significant because there have been no confirmed snow leopards in this ecosystem since like 1910. When I was a Peace Corps volunteer, I got my start in wildlife biology by volunteering with a project that sent me up here to go look for snow leopard sign. And we couldn't find anything. We found like these elusive things that might be snow leopard sign, but we weren't really sure. <coughs> and so to find that track up there felt like uh, a little sign from the mountains that we had paid our respects properly at these ovos. The outcome of the 2013 work um, was that we were able to identify six wolverines and you can see, th this is pretty much along our ski route, so this does not define what those wolverines' territories were, but there's a perfect alternation with male, female, male, female, male, female. There's nothing in here at all, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment. <sighs> this gentleman is named Tumursuk. 
And um, he is important to the rest of this story because he is a park director and a ranger and a biologist, Mongolian park uh, biologist, who was formerly the director of Lake Hovskul National Park. And he found these three wolverine kits under this rock in April of 2010. The mom was there, and he spooked her off. And because he's tumor sick, his name means iron axe, um, which is extremely appropriate to his personality. <laughs> uh, he loves wildlife. And he does not really see a boundary between humans and wildlife, so he decided he was going to just pick up these wolverine kits and take a picture with them. Um, he said they stink worse than anything he'd ever smelled in his entire life. But otherwise, he thought they were really cute. Um, and then he put them back under the rock when he was done. And uh, he off he went. He said the mother came back. So um, I, I believe him. I don't think he was you know, pulling anything um, or trying to hurt them in any way. He just wanted his picture with them. Um, this man, Tumorsuk, uh, for political reasons, ended up leaving Lake Hovskul National Park, which is over here and was attached to this horrible Stardic strictly protected area. These two were, were managed together. He was born and raised in the Darhad Valley in this town of Ulanul, and he decided um, that he needed to form some more national parks. Um, and so in this area back here, starting around 2007, there was an influx of gold miners. There's a huge amount of gold and jade back in these mountains. And there was, a, uh, I think, like 7,000 what they refer to them as ninja miners. Um, they're artisanal miners. They're just out there panning for gold. Showed up and moved in back in the taiga, and they were trashing everything. Um, and so Tumorsuk and the local residents got together. They formed a petition. Um, you have to get 70% approval of the local population in Mongolia in order to form a protected area. So he and a couple of other people in this town went around. They got 70% uh, signatures on a petition. They submitted it to parliament. And they formed these two additional parks. Um, this one is a national park, and this one is a strictly protected area. And um, they took, they, they requested that uh, Hordal Sardik be taken out of the administration of Lake Hovskull and placed into an administration with these other two parks. And they formed this set of protected areas that is one and a half times the size of Yellowstone National Park. No roads really a, an incredibly pristine and beautiful place. I don't like to refer to it as wilderness because there are people back there still to this day and they have a very intimate and close relationship with the landscape. It is not an unpeopled wilderness, but it is a place that is very wild and still makes room for people to be there. Um, so this happened in 2012, right before our expedition. And I knew that I wanted to replicate the Wolverine Ski Expedition because I wanted to see if it could be used as a long-term monitoring tool. Um, however, with a national park in place, there's a whole other set of potential obstacles, but also potentially great partnerships. And fortunately, Tumorsuk is a kind of person who makes a good partner, a good institutional partner. And um, he's also the kind of person who has a big vision. And when I was talking to him about carrying on Wolverine work in this area, he said, you know, there's so much stuff that needs to be done in these parks. Like, everybody here knows what's back there, but there's no science. Nothing's ever been done in terms of the, the research side of it. You know, there's some stuff on Argali and Ibex, which are wild goats and wild sheep. Um, and there's, you know, people have been up here looking for snow leopards, but we don't know what kind of insects we have. We don't know what kind of small mammals we have. Um, and so can you please also do these things? And I was like... OK, you know, I can't just be gallivanting around here with a Wolverine obsession. That's not fair. Like, I need, to be, I need to be responsive to what the Mongolians want. And so I thought, how can I do that? I need to acquire <laughs> some people to help me. Um, and I thought it would be a really cool thing to start a study abroad program. And so I partnered with uh, Round River Conservation Studies. They run international abroad programs all over the world. And they, they do it in a way that I really respect and like. And so I asked them if they wanted to start a program in Mongolia, if they would be willing to do the recruitment and managing the insurance and all of that. And, uh, and then I would handle the field side of it and do the liaison and liaising with the, the national parks in Mongolia. And they said yes. And before I knew it, I, I was a little bit cynical about this uh, when I started. I was like, okay, now I have some minions, and you know they're going to be really spoiled 20-year-olds, but I can put up with it, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and then these kids showed up in Mongolia. And I'm not just saying this because one of them is in the audience. I, I was 
blown away by how dedicated and how passionate and how interested and how respectful these kids were. And so, I'm sorry to be referring to you as kids, um, but you kind of are kids to me in, in the most affectionate way possible. Um, and so this is just my, my moment to say that whatever nonsense you hear about the up and coming generation being lazy or out of touch or glued to their phones or whatever it is that you're hearing about these guys, it's not true. And we owe it to them as the older generation to work for their future, to leave them something that they can carry on and pass on to their, their next generation. All right, that said, these are some of the, these awesome people and they are looking at a set of Wolverine tracks. Um, I certainly did not think that running a semester program, I was going to uh, get students who would be able to track Wolverines because we needed to end the program before they all froze to death in their tents, which was a very real risk. Um, and so I was like, well, guys, you know, you're going to be coming over here, you're going to be doing work, but you're not going to get to track Wolverines. It started snowing on us on September 5th, and it did not stop <laughs> until we left in November. And by the time we left, it was, what, 25 below zero, I think? Um, so it was at the limits of the students' gear. I think they were starting to be a little worried that they really were not going to be able to, uh, to hack through or hack it. I mean, I have no doubt that about their character, but it was, it was actually a concern that the, the equipment was going to give out and not be adequate. And the, the positive side of all of this was that within two weeks of uh, the snow coming down, the entire area where we were working was tracked up with Wolverine tracks. This is further evidence that there are a lot of wolverines in this ecosystem. For whatever reason, they are abundant and uh, they seem to be doing really well. So, whoop. Um, this is, these are just a few pictures from the student program in the summer. We also started a, a large mammal monitoring program with cameras and uh, a lot of ranger training um, with things like GPS because the Mongolian government has a tendency to give give the National Park Rangers these tools, um, but not really tell them how to use them. <laughs> and so you can imagine being a Mongolian in the Darhad Valley, whether or not you're conversant with, you know, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's theory of whatever, um, you know, getting a GPS where the instructions are only in English is going to be really <laughs> hard. And so um, one of the things that the students can do is that as they're learning how to use these things, they can also teach the rangers. And then they form these really close relationships with the rangers as well, which is just a joy to see. And so um, this, is, this is sort of how the student program was operating through its first year. It was very successful. And then in um, March of 2019, my four friends and I returned to carry out this Wolverine ski expedition. Again, this is the route that we took. So this section we didn't get to do um, because this is actually the Hordel Sardik. Um, we didn't get to ski through here because we ran out of snow. Last time we went this way. Uh, this year we decided we were going to go this way because I really wanted to get into Uantaiga down here. Um, and I didn't want to run out of snow on that end of the trip. And so we started this way. Also it's clockwise which is the appropriate way to go when you are in a Buddhist or a shamanic situation. So I felt like that also might be a better approach. Um, and these were our resupply points. This little leg here, we didn't, we didn't do. That was where we came out last time, so just ignore that. Um, but we had a resupply here, we had a resupply here, and we had a resupply here, and then we got picked up here. So how many of you guys have done long range ski touring has anybody here ever done anything like this? Okay. Um, how do you prepare for something like this? These are my two friends, uh, Sarah and her husband Dylan, looking like uh, Smurfs, as they, as they refer to themselves in these puffy jackets. This is a um, jacket that's basically a minus 20 degree sleeping bag that you wear. This is an essential piece of gear if you're doing this in Mongolia. Um, this is in Yellowstone. You know, you just you go out and you test all of your equipment. Um, and so this was right shortly before we left. We went out and we did a big expedition through Yellowstone to make sure everything worked. Um, there's a lot of preparation. I wrote another grant. There is an organization called the Trust for Mutual Understanding. They support uh, cultural and scientific exchanges between the former communist world and the United States. They're a fantastic uh, resource for anybody who's trying to do this kind of work. And they gave us the, the bulk of the funds, but we also ended up with a lot of sponsorships from various gear companies. And um, we did things like avalanche training. 
that's essential too. You don't want to get avalanche when you're doing something like this. Uh, so we did a course in Montana. Uh, we spent a lot of time looking at Google Earth because I have never been in Ulan Taiga before this, and so we really needed to make sure that we were picking a route that we thought would go. Um, we didn't want to get into a situation where we were going to get cliffed out or dropped down a canyon. That's been known to happen. Um, the maps for this part of the world are not great. So um, a lot of prep. And then, of course, the gear. Um, a lot of gear. And I'm happy to talk more with anybody who might be interested in doing something like this about what you would need. But uh, suffice to say that it's a lot of gear. Um, you need a minus 20 degree sleeping bag. You need uh, some pretty swanky uh, ski boots. Um, we were using DinaFits. And uh, you need, most importantly, skis and skins. Um, these skis were donated to us by Altai Skis. It's a ski company that actually um, works in the Altai region of uh, Mongolia and China. This is one of the oldest skiing traditions in the world. So they have these traditional skis. And this guy, his name is Niels, um, is just really fascinated with this ski tradition and has started manufacturing uh, modern skis that are built on the, on the same sort of design principles for trekking around in these uh, unconsolidated snow conditions. And then skins are these things that you stick to the bottom of your skis so that you can go uphill um, without you know, sliding backwards. They're called skins. Anyone want to guess why they're called skins? Yeah, they used to be skin. And I'm going to show you a picture of some of these traditional skis in a few minutes, and you will see why. Um, so that, that was our setup. Um, we were fortunate enough to get all of our food donated by Katahdin, the company. Katahdin, um, they have Al Alpine Air as their um, division that, that makes these dehydrated camping meals. And this is Sarah's house. Uh, and these are the boxes in her basement. <laughs> um, and this is her food for the expedition right here. So that's, that's what it looks like physically laid out. Um, and then we had to pack all of that up and take it over to Mongolia with us. And then I had to do all the scientific equipment buying. These are data loggers that you put um, into, well, I was going to put them under the talus and log temperature differences between sub, sub talus um, and surface to see what kind of thermal um, insulation <coughs> talus would provide in hot summer days. I wanted to get a whole year's worth of data on this starting in uh, the cold part of the year in the winter and looking at the differences between subsurface and surface temperatures. So there's all kinds of prep work like that. All the scientific stuff had to be ready to go. All the gear had to be ready to go. And then we got there. The rangers were resupplying us. And we again, we have a great working relationship with them. So they were really excited about this, which was unexpected and touching to see. They're also really worried. They were like, are you sure? And we were like, yeah, we're going to be fine. And they were like, you don't have any horses. And we were like, yeah, we know. <laughs> That's why we can go where we can go. Um, so Mongolians are great outdoors people, but they really, I mean, if they need to go to the restroom, they get on a horse. <laughs> like, nobody walks anywhere. And so the idea of putting all that weight on your back and carrying it yourself was just sort of <laughs> mind-boggling to them. But they were really excited. So this is, I think this was day four, and um, this was skiing into Ulan Taiga, and I was so excited because it was so beautiful. Um, this is up near the headwaters of the Delgarmurin, which is actually the headwaters of the system that feeds into Lake Baikal. Um, and it's just we were skiing down these rivers. Um, mostly we were on the rivers. And we were picking up Wolverine tracks all over the place, so it was great. There were, even at the beginning stages of this expedition, a number of occasions when we had to take our skis off and uh, climb up canyon walls and stuff like that. But for the most part, the snow was pretty, pretty decent. Um, this is the top of our highest pass. This was one of the only passes where we actually use the Abbey gear. You can see that one of us went around the OVO to pay our respects. <laughs> the other four <laughs> were too tired at that point to be bothered with that, but I felt like it was important. So, um, And you can see, too, this OVO is quite small, which means that not that many people have been there because when you travel past an OVO, you're obligated to put three rocks on it. So this is a pretty <laughs> remote area up close to the Russian border. And this is at the, at the top of that pass um, as we were about to go down, looking into the abyss. Spectacularly beautiful country. Shortly after that pass, we came across, uh, across this, you know, 
highway, basically. We're like, whoa, what's going on? But thank gosh we don't have to break trail anymore because that was really exhausting. Um, and we realized that we had picked up the tail end of the reindeer migration. So the reindeer herders were gathering all of their reindeer in from their winter pastures and bringing them down towards the summer pastures. And once we came down off of that pass, uh, everything was trampled. If, you, if you're a really good skier, you can ski between trees with, without that much trouble. But if you're trying to do it on a packed down reindeer trail that's basically ice, it's terrifying. <laughs> and so we ended up uh, taking our skis off for a lot of this. And we were coming down the path. Um, I'll tell some more of that story in a minute. And we came across a little tent perched up on the, on the bank. And I was like, I think that's a ranger tent. You know, why is anybody out here in this? But it looks to me like a ranger tent. So I just like, oh, and, uh, you know, these two rangers um, who are good friends poked their heads out of the tent. And they were like, oh, Rebecca, you're here. You know, we're so excited. <laughs> By the way, there's no snow. Isn't that terrible? Um, we're going to put your stuff on our horse and take you up to our ranger cabin um, and <coughs> make, make you guys tea and let you spend the night under, under shelter. And we were like, oh, that's very nice of you. Thank you. Um, and so these two guys loaded our stuff onto their horses, and we just had to carry our skis. And it was a, a great relief. This place was infested with ticks. It was awful. Um, there are a lot of moose in here, and so everybody was covered with ticks. It was terrible. Um, but it was really great to hang out with these guys. They showed us photos. Um, the reindeer herders, apparently on that trail that we had been coming down the night before, had rigged up some X-Acto knife-tipped uh, tripwire crossbows. <laughs> um, so they were like, you guys need to be really careful because the reindeer herders have figured out how to do this, and they put their reindeer in this pasture, and then they'll rig all the trails around it with these things to keep the wolves from getting the reindeer. <laughs> we were like, oh, good thing we didn't know about that or didn't run into those when we were careening down these icy trails at 75 miles per hour. Um, and uh, we also got caught up at, um, this is our resupply. So this is a ranger named Ganhuyuk. And uh, we went up from those other rangers. We skied 17 miles up this river. And we got to the next ranger cabin. And these guys were waiting with our food. And we were really, really excited to see them. Um, and uh, we got caught up in the rounding up the stray reindeer um, activity. So all of these reindeer that had fallen behind the main migration were hanging out um, at this cabin tied up. Uh, and the reindeer herders were bringing in um, more strays as we were waiting. So this is really cool because, I mean, who doesn't want to hang out with a domestic deer? They are the coolest things ever. And um, the, the other guys had never had a chance to interact with reindeer before. So it was really exciting for them to, to be able to do that. And Gan Huyuk, who's a total, this guy, He's a total joker. Um, he was like, oh, Rebecca, you have to come here and take your picture with the reindeer and with me, and you have to look really heroic. And so we tried to take this picture like four or five times, and he was like, no, you've got to like stand up taller and like look more heroic. <laughs> I was like, OK, that would be cool. Um, so and then I, I, this is only the second, the second selfie that I have ever tried to take in my life. But um, the thing about reindeer, if you ever run into them, is that they're, they're always always in search of salt. And so they come up to you, and they're adorable, because they're deer, and they're coming towards you. And they've got those big eyes, and they're so cute. And then they just start to lick you. <laughs> and then it gets like quite alarming, and you have to try to fend them off. And so I was like, I'll take a selfie with this reindeer. But uh, that didn't really work, because all she wanted to do was lick my face. <laughs> um, we also had some ski races with the rangers. Um, and we thought we were going to be teaching them how to use these skis because they'd never been on skis like this before. Um, but this guy put on the skis, and Hillary, who's quite a good skier, she's probably the best skier of, of the bunch, was like, OK, now I'm going to teach you how to use these skis, Botbold. And he was like, OK. And he just took off. <laughs> and he was faster than she was, and he was you know, a pretty good skier. And it turns out that there actually was a cross-country ski program when these guys were growing up. And so they actually knew how to use the skis. Um, <laughs> And so as we were talking to them, they were like, oh, these skis, these are really useful. You know, to get here with all this food, we had to go over these passes, and we had our horses, and they were floundering, and we were stranded in snow up to our chests. And um, even though it doesn't look very snowy at this place, there's a pass that they had to come over back here that was pretty difficult for them to get over. And so we were talking to them, and they were like, oh, it would be really cool if we had some skis like this so that we could patrol more effectively. Um, because even still, especially up in this drainage, these miners keep coming back in and trying to pan for gold. And so we were like, oh, well, maybe we could get you some skis. Um, these are some more 
um, after we left that resupply, headed up uh, some of the rivers, and you start to get these really cool ice formations. There are some wolverine tracks in this picture too, but you can't really see them very well. Um, so this is a typical morning. We had this <coughs> floorless tent from Hyperlite Mountain Gear um, called a mid. And you just, you build it with your ski poles as the center pole and you pull the lines out um, for tension. So you're not carrying any poles. It's a really lightweight um, option. And then you put the snow around the tent in order to insulate it and it's cozy and it's a great, it's a great um, backcountry tent. And so we would wake up pretty much at sunrise, um, eat our breakfast of delicious dehydrated oatmeal. And then um, we would get going, um, break down the tent, put all our gear in our little packs and head out. And we would basically ski all day and uh, we would camp when, we, when, the sun, when it got towards sunset. This, at this point, we started having a problem because the snow was really bad and it was warm and the snow kept melting and that we kept running into these huge swaths without any snow. And we couldn't track, you know, if you don't have any snow, you can't track wolverines. And so I was, we went for a whole <coughs> week with no wolverine tracks and I was starting to get pretty depressed. But we would also run into these situations where this is a reindeer herder camp and they leave the, the structure of the ort set up. Anybody can use it who comes along. So we decided we were going to test a new method for setting up this tent. Um, when we arrived, it looked like this. And we crawled into the tent. And when we got out the next morning, it looked like this. So Tanger, the sky, was obviously rolling out the white carpet because uh, the sky knew that we needed some snow and was trying to oblige us. That's what I tell myself. Anyway, <laughs> we got to our second resupply. We did some more um, promotion of, of skiing amongst uh, the, the rangers and the park staff. This is Laugua. She, Tumersuk is the park director, but this woman makes the park run. Um, she's the one who keeps everything going and she keeps everybody in line. And so she came out to our resupply and it was howling cold. We had to cross this river. There was no frozen part, uh, like we, there, there was no ice on the river. So we actually, for a long time, were going up the river thinking we're not gonna be able to get across this river. And then we got across and we made it to our resupply. It was really, really cold. And, um, and we were like, well, pretty soon Tumersuk and Laugua will be here and there's a ranger cabin right there and they're gonna let us in and it's gonna be really nice and warm and we'll have a stove and we can have some you know, tea with them. And uh, they showed up and they were like, oh, uh, Bopold has the key and <laughs> there's only one key and he's off fighting a forest fire and we don't know where he is. And I was like, a forest fire in March? But yes, there was a forest fire in March, um, which is another sign of the times. And also, we ended up having to shelter in this little horse shed over here, which makes for a better story, but was really disappointing at the time. <laughs> There's Tumersook skiing around. Um, in the background, that's a, so there, is anybody here a fisherman? Okay, do you know about the fish in Mongolia? Yeah, they have time in. These things are, they're up to 200 pounds. They're this huge salmonid. And uh, there's a big fly fishing um, industry there where tours will come over from the US and Europe and pay big money to these communities to fly fish. So this is a fly fishing camp. And it's boarded up because it's a winter and nobody fly fishes in the winter. Um, so at this point, we were only able really to track wolverines when they were, their tracks had been left in this soft ice that softens up during the day and then hardens over at night. And that, those were the only tracks that we were finding. We were still finding wolverine tracks, but really not that many. <sighs> um, this is just a fun picture. Uh, in 2013, we were going in the opposite direction. So we skied down that waterfall. That was tricky. <laughs> Turns out it's a lot easier to ski down a waterfall than to ski up a waterfall. Um, and so we ended up having to detour <coughs> up, up this cliff um, which added a few hours to our day and a little <coughs> bit of stress and um, increase in technical expertise, let's, let's just say. And this is, this is in April. Um, and by now, as you can see, it was quite warm during the days. We were skiing in our, in our short sleeve shirts and tank tops. Um, but still cold enough to hold these huge ice formations, which I just think are so beautiful. This is, this is a phenomenon called off ice. Um, it's where groundwater freezes in successive layers and it just creates these big cascading ice sculptures. So during the summer, this just looks like, whoop, this just looks like forest bottom or rock or scree. Um, and then in the winter, these ice formations appear. And it's all just because there's permafrost under there and it's super wet 
and um, it freezes. So this was our last significant pass. It was absolutely beautiful. We were able to ski five minutes down before we ran out of snow, so that was a good day. And this, this is where the snow really ran out towards the end of the trip. <laughs> this is really the last of the snow. And we skied, as you can see, <laughs> we skied up that thing until we could not ski anymore because it's so annoying <laughs> to have to stop and take your skis off. It's not even carrying them that's necessarily the problem, but the, like, the time-consuming nature of having to stop and take them off and attach them to your pack, and then you have to get the pack back on. Ugh, just annoying. So um, we, we stuck to the snow for as long as we could, and then some. <laughs> so this is a point at which we were just like, not stopping. <laughs> and then it was over. Um, and... We had the, our driver, Chinbold, who is another absolute miracle of a human being and who makes both the student program and these ski expeditions function, um, was at this remote location on the day and at the time that we asked him to be. And we were communicating via inReach. Um, so we were sending these satellite messages. We weren't sure whether they were going through. And so everything had this feeling of like, it's very tenuous and it's always a miracle when things work, but they always work because the rangers we work with are amazing. Not only that, but they took us to their homes and they fed us. Um, this little girl is the daughter of Dalai Bayer, um, whose house this is. And she developed an infatuation with Sarah, so she followed Sarah everywhere, which was really cute. Um, girls in Mongolia and boys, actually, children have their heads shaved at four or five years, four for the girls and five for the boys. So she had had her head shaved in this head shaving ceremony that they all have, which is why she's got a buzz cut there. Um, sorry, this is the gross, the gross photo, but um, those boots are plastic boots. They're really hard, and um, this was the state of my feet at the end. All of those toenails all fell off. Um, so, yeah, you know, and actually my feet were in the best shape of anybody's on the expedition. So what were the scientific results? If you remember the 2013 expedition, we got 33 samples. We skied 100 miles further in this expedition, and we only got 17 samples. And out of those 17 samples, I'm confident that only two or three of them are wolverine. We found 40 sets of tracks, so we still were finding a lot of tracks. Um, but the low snow conditions and the warm weather made it very difficult. And as far as this being a method that you can use consistently, like every five years to go out and monitor a population of wolverines in an area where you don't have a helicopter or a snowmobile or a fixed wing aircraft, um, it really depends on the snow conditions, right? I think it could be a viable method. You could look at, at change in the wolverine population over time. You could see if those same wolverines were in this ecosystem now as were five years ago or six years ago. But if you don't have the right snow conditions, you just waste a lot of time and energy. And you've done something really cool, and it makes a great story, and you get to go home to your hometown and make a cool presentation about it, <laughs> but you are not getting insight into the wolverine population. So this was our wrap-up photo, and these are the, the critical crew. There's Chinbold, our driver, Neam Hishek, who is the director of tourism and outreach, um, Hilary Eisen, who was our organizer for gear and uh, ski expertise, Salgwa, again, she's the office manager and she makes everything go. Jen Higgins, who was the other woman on this expedition who spoke some Mongolian, which was a huge relief to me not to be the only person who was capable of communicating. Um, and uh, Nansalma, who is the caretaker um, of the, the house, um, the, <coughs> what is that thing called in uh, English? The, Mong the office space, basically, like the, the fenced in yard that where, um, where the office is. And Sarah and her husband, Dylan. Sarah uh, is a disease ecologist with Wildlife Conservation Society. And Dylan was at uh, Yale School of Forestry with me. Jen is a, is a veterinarian. And Hillary is the coordinator for Winter Wildlands Association, which is an organization that advocates for non-motorized recreation. They're all people whose names I feel like you should know, because they're cool. <laughs> <laughs> These are those traditional skis. You can see they are actually, in fact, covered with horse hide. Those skis are now at my house in Montana. They gave them to me as a gift, which was super cool. It's probably one of the last pairs of these traditional skis that have been made because the ski tradition there is dying out. But Hillary and Sarah were really taken with how taken the rangers were with skis like these. And so they decided to organize a fundraiser while I was in Mongolia this semester to get 
skis for all the rangers. And Altai Skis is donating them, to, or not donating them, but they're selling them to us at a, at a very low price. Um, and so we, are, we actually have raised enough money to outfit all the rangers with skis, which are going to help with their backcountry patrols. Super cool. And also, I get to go back and teach them all how to ski, which is going to be really fun. <laughs> Meanwhile, the student program continues um, doing amazing things. And uh, these are just for fun, but this is one of my students, a veterinary student. Uh, anybody want to guess what she's doing? <laughs> oh, what, you want to say that louder, Cameron? She's castrating. <laughs> yeah, she's castrating a yak. <laughs> this girl was just like uh, preternatural with her Mongolian language abilities. And she learned how to introduce herself. She charmed everybody. And then one day she came to me and she said, how do you say I want to castrate a yak in Mongolian? And I was like, hmm, do I want to teach you that? But I did, and she, she told the rangers she wanted to castrate a yak, and they liked her so much, and they were so charmed by her. They were like, yeah, we can make that happen for you. Um, this kid's expression <laughs> reflects my skepticism about this endeavor. I have never been so nervous, because I was like, if she kills this yak, like, we are going to be booted out of here. But she did it. And she, she actually castrated two of them. She did it successfully. And then they served us the balls in uh, soup. So it was win-win <laughs> <laughs> for everybody but the yak. Um, so this is uh, just some more student uh, Mongolian bonding, just teaching uh, dance moves. And that went both ways. The Mongolians really like to waltz. So Cameron, can you waltz now? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. And now uh, Laogua and Tumursuk know how to do whatever this dance move is. Do you know what this is called? I don't know what he's doing. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll just call it the Cal because that's his name. Um, and then there are these, these moments too, which just really are so great to see where these are two of the, the, the daughters of the Rangers. Um, this girl, Arvin, is the daughter of the, the goofy ranger who wanted me to pose with the reindeer. And her English is incredible. So I f she Facebook messages me all the time. And um, she, she just, I don't know how she picks it up, but she is able to communicate at a level that I find astonishing, considering how, um, how little opportunity she actually has to speak English. And um, this is uh, the daughter of the caretaker, um, Deggy. She has three sisters. They're all there, or she's one of three, and they're all. It's like Delger Bayer, Delger Stetzig, and Delger Ma, and they all go by Deggy for short. So this is middle <laughs> Deggy. Um, also, she's um, a little bit younger, so her English isn't as good yet, but she's coming right along. And so these, this is um, one of our students, Josie Norris, who was so taken with her research that she actually went back to UVM fundraised uh, $7,000 and returned this year to pursue the research that she had been doing. So that was super cool. We're starting to work a little bit with the reindeer herders. And um, this, these guys are by far the biggest uh, human relations issue for the parks. Um, and the parks are a huge issue for them because the parks outlawed hunting. And as I mentioned at the beginning, they get most of their protein from hunting. They know more about wildlife than anybody I have ever talked to any group of people I've ever talked to. I have a huge amount of respect, although I'm not a hunter myself or a trapper myself. What they know about the environment they live in is so detailed, and it would be a travesty if that knowledge were to be lost. At the same time, there is a really serious wildlife conservation issue in this ecosystem, and so how to work constructively with this group of people towards conservation to reduce conflict and to make sure that their rights aren't violated as indigenous people is another project that we're starting to take on. Of course, wolverines are really cool, but they are not the only animals out there. And so um, pertinent to tumor six request to us, we started doing research on butterflies. We documented 96 <laughs> butterfly species in two valleys of the Horridal Sardic this year. Um, for comparison, how many species are there in the entire country of Great Britain? Does anyone know? 59. I think in Massachusetts there are about 100. So this area is incredibly diverse for butterflies. That is not something that we were expecting. This is von Simbaru. It's this really weird, crazy, meter-tall, furry uh, medicinal plant that grows for seven years, flowers, and dies. It's also talus obligate, so it only grows at high elevation talus sites. It's a really weird plant, and it's medicinally important. It has pharmacological effects on the lungs. Um, and so we're doing a study, population study of, of that species. <coughs> Pikas, um, which are another climate-sensitive species. They live in talus. Um, and some of them live on the steppe, but they're, they're highly sensitive to temperature changes. And we thought there were two species up there. My co-instructor, 
um, who's a pretty creative thinker about these things, started recording their calls and looking at the sonographs of the calls, and we realized there are actually, actually three species of pikas up here, so <coughs> that was pretty neat. Um, and then there's a, a bird component as well, um, raptors, uh, passerines, and then uh, waterfowl, and Cameron, when she was my, my student, did the waterfowl study um, for the fall migratory bird species. And then, of course, there's the camera trap grid. We've set out 50 cameras to try to monitor wildlife, including wolverines. And this is a picture <laughs> of Tumersuk and Badma, our Mongolian um, instructor. She's doing her PhD at Montana State University, and uh, this project would not run without her. She is critical to this. Um, and so she, she works with us, and this is one of our students, um, Noah, uh, looking at a photo of a lynx on, on the cameras. And bringing in these camera cards from these cameras to the office is always such an exciting time. Everybody crowds around, and as these animals come up, you get lynx, and you get you know wolverines, and you get elk, and everybody is just like gasping and uh, cheering, and I mean, it's just this really great moment where you realize how much everybody loves wildlife. Most importantly, this <laughs> showed up on the camera. So for those of you who don't know, that is a snow leopard butt. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we haven't gotten uh, a full picture of this animal, but this is adequate for our purposes. So there are officially snow leopards back in the Hordel's Hard Egg. Not only that, Tumor Sook picked up a scat from this animal, and we analyzed it, and she is a female. So where there is a female snow leopard, there is often a male close behind, and then you get babies. So this is pretty exciting. Of course, Tumor Sook really likes Argali, which are these big horned sheep that he's been protecting for 30 years, and he's done such a great job of it that there's now a prey base for the snow leopards. So he's really excited about the snow leopard right now, but I'm just waiting to see what happens when he realizes that most of what the snow leopard is eating are his sheep. <laughs> <laughs> and these are just some, um, I'm gonna see if I can make this go. These are just for fun. These are boar. Yeah, they're pigs. I mean, whatever. But they're quite cute. <laughs> that is a lynx? That is a lynx, yes. A curious lynx. How many of you guys have cats? Yeah, doesn't it? I mean, it just seems yeah. it's acting exactly like a domestic cat. Ooh. <laughs> Does the camera make any sound at all to alert the animal? Um, I think it must make some sound. Like, even if it's not audible to our ears, it's probably audible to theirs. But we were struck by how aware all the animals seemed of this camera. And right. so I asked Tumor Sook, like, you know, did you, did you, do, do you put anything out there? Or like, you know, put any scent out as an attractant. He was like, well, I tried to mask the smell of the rest of our activities by peeing there. Correct. <laughs> 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 That's why. Good idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is pretty cool. Oh. That's a bear cub. Bear. So there's bear reproduction and also bear, we've documented even in the two years that we've been running these expansion of the bears from into a valley where there were no bears uh, last year. So it's, it's pretty cool. And finally, and most importantly, <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, this is this project, um, whether it's Wolverines or skiing or the student program, to me is all about bridging divides between different <coughs> cultures, different countries, different communities, and you know, different uh, beings, human, non-human landscape, and learning how to care about each other and take care of each other. Um, if anybody is interested, there is this. Um, program that, that you can look into if you want to go to Mongolia at the American Center for Mongolian Studies. Um, I'm not going to go into that too much, but ask me about it later. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.